Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. Hey, lovers of small businesses and good stories in general. Welcome to episode 98 of Small Business War Stories. And today I have the pleasure and honor to sit down with Barry Moltz in Chicago. And Barry is a well-known radio personality, author, and all-around uh, really uh, expert on small businesses. And we talked about a lot of the things that he has learned in his, um, you know, all his experiences about uh, running his own small businesses as well as all the things that he has learned with all the books that he has published and his radio program. So this is really kind of uh, um, selfishly for me, so like a way, like somebody whom I look up to that has a lot of expertise in the small business area. I wanted to really sit down with him and understand uh, and get a lot of his knowledge. And you get all that knowledge as well as a listener of Small Business War Stories. Um, so yeah, Barry's a great, uh, great guy. We talk a lot about like in his big thing is how, what gets businesses unstuck. So there are a lot of things where businesses get stuck. I've definitely been there before. So we discuss what are the things that people can do to get themselves unstuck. So you will not want to miss this episode. This episode is brought to you by Proven, Proven proven.com. That is a company that I started and it is a small business hiring tool. So if you need to hire for your small business, Go check it out right now. You can post your job. You can distribute your job widely to different job boards. Organize your applicants. It's a great place for you to do your hiring. We also have a great resource at blog.proven.com with all kinds of advice for small businesses, including the Small Business War Stories podcast. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode with Barry Moltz in Chicago, Illinois. And we are live here in beautiful Chicago, Illinois. And it is absolutely gorgeous. We're here. We have a view of the skyline. And I have the honor and pleasure to sit down with Barry Moltz, who is a man who wears many hats, but he's a small business expert. And he is a speaker. He's an author. He has his own radio show. And he has uh, a, a, a few decades of experience working with small businesses. So welcome to the show, Barry. Thank you. you know, if I could hold a real job, I would. <laughs> if not, I'm just a small business owner. <laughs> That's that's great. Yeah, that's actually a lot. A lot of small businesses and a lot of people I've met, and I tell even this to my employees. I've done every job in my company, but I wouldn't hire myself to do any job in my company. I hear that. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about like your big mantra is to get small businesses unstuck, right? And that's something that happens a lot. And, and I want to I want to get into uh, actually before we even get into that, how did you how did this evolve? Like what I mean, nobody I think graduates. I I certainly didn't graduate from college thinking I was going to be a podcaster, blues musician, you know, entrepreneur. So how, how did you evolve from somebody uh, who, who was, you know, a young, you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed to now this uh, authority in small business? Well, when I graduated college, I wanted to be president of IBM. Okay. So I graduated from college out of Boston. I got a job with IBM. This is the early 80s, and I wore the blue suit, the red tie, the, the white shirt, and I was really gung-ho about large corporations and big business. And then I had a boss where he had contests, mm-hmm. and first prize was always lunch with him. <laughs> What's second prize? Two lunches with you? And I just didn't like the big corporate structure, and I read a business called Growing Your Business, and I said, you know, I can really do this myself. But before I did, I got hired away by one of my customers who ran a small business, about 50 people at the time, and he hired me to head up his sales. And so I got a kind of taste of a small business then, and then he fired me a year later. I said, you know, I can do this myself. So over the period of a decade, I had my own businesses. I went out of business. I got what, kicked what out. What was the first partners. one you started? First business I started was called Yes, We Deliver. So think of it as Grubhub early 1990s, where yeah. we published a directory of every place in a certain Chicago neighborhood that delivered. Yeah. Cause you, you know, you really couldn't go on the internet. There wasn't really Google, those kind of things. Yeah. So that business went out of business. Then I started a technology business where we sold, it was really the precursor to Siri, the precursor to Alexa, where in industry, you could go out and you could talk to the computer uh, instead of writing something. We were a reseller for Dragon Systems, and those two people kicked me out of their business. 
Then I started a business uh, called SciTech where we were actually a mail order catalog for scientific and technical software. You gotta take yourself back to the mid 90s where if you wanted to buy a piece of software, mm -hmm. you couldn't go on the web, the web didn't exist. You didn't go into a store. There was egghead software maybe where you could buy some stuff. And a lot of the scientific and technical software was developed by uh, mathematicians at universities or work for national labs. So we found all those people, specialty graphic software, math software, uh, engineering software. We put it into a catalog, hired people to talk about uh, these particular pieces of software, and then sent them out to all these folks. And then eventually we went online. In, the late, in 1999, we sold the business because a historical company that dealt a lot with scientists, they wanted to get online, so they okay. used our platform to do that. So you've mentioned four businesses there, or three or four? Three, three. So how, what, over what period of time was it? Over this? 10 years. Okay, so what was it like to um, shut down? Like, what was it? How did you learn how to emotionally deal with the, you know, ramping up of a business, it not working out, getting the crap beat out of you, getting up, dusting yourself off, and keeping going? A lot of therapy. Yeah. Um, it's hard. I, I think it's. Um, I, I think you pay. Uh, pay. Uh, you face an impossible situation because uh, entrepreneurs, for better or for worse, identify so closely with their businesses and. When you go out of business, it's like your baby's ugly, right? Or your baby just died. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's a horrible thing to happen to any parent. So the way that I really survived it, and that's what a term, I'll, a term I'll use is, I got really good at let going of whatever happened yesterday to try to have a fairly short memory because yesterday's yesterday, and I'm going to lick my wounds, I'm going to cheer the darkness, I'm going to have a pity party for myself, but pretty soon I'm going to let go and I'm going to move on. And only by letting go and moving on do you give yourself another chance of success. And right. that was really the basis for my second book, which is called Bounce. Yeah. So and you don't, and basically you don't become the failure, right? So you dis disassociate yourself from like, hey, that didn't work, but that doesn't mean that I don't work. It just means that that particular idea didn't right. work. I say you try not to wallow in it yeah. for, for too long. I mean, it's okay to do it for a little bit. You're entitled. Yeah. But somewhere along the line, too, unfortunately, the way that failures looked at in American business is that that failure is always good, that we always can learn from failure. But let me tell you, sometimes we can't learn from failure right now. Sometimes it just sucks. Sometimes it just happens. I mean, in one of my last businesses, my largest customer was indicted by the government. What was I learned? I shouldn't do business with, with, with criminals, right? So I think you learn what you can, but then you got to move on. And I think letting go is very difficult in this culture. Okay. So because, because there's this attachment to your failure having been a lesson. Yeah, sometimes there's nothing to learn. I think we keep saying, oh, to make myself feel better, oh, this failure must have happened to me for some reason. No, sometimes it just sucks. There's absolutely no okay, reason. But let's talk about that. Sometimes there are reasons and lessons. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you differentiate between those two? And how do you, I guess, navigate that process of uh, detachment and bouncing and from, from like actually being able to? Because what I always tell people is like, if you run into a spot in the wall, right. don't try to keep going through the same spot in the wall. You can take a step to the right and see if there's a door. Right. If you right? find they yourself own... in a hole, the first thing you got to do is stop digging. Yeah. <laughs> same kind of thing. Yeah. So in, in the, because the, the problem is if you keep doing the exact same thing and then you're saying this sucks, this sucks, well, of course it sucks. So, but how do you differentiate those lessons versus like this emotional letting go that allows you to grow? Well, I think two, th two things. One is... You, you mourn it, right? You try to learn whatever you can for a very short period of time. But then as you said, you, you have to move on and not let it define it define you. It's, you're still gonna keep thinking about it, right? It's still gonna be in the back of your mind and maybe you can learn a lesson later on. So for me, for example, one of the lessons that I learned in my second business was it wasn't what business I was going into that was important, it was who I was doing the business with. That was really the important learning part, but I didn't realize that until two years later into my third business, mm. because who you're doing it with is so much important than what you're doing. You mean as a partner? As a partner or whoever you hire who's on your team, right. that's really the critical part. What about as a customer? Um, I think that you should, if you can, enjoy your customers. Um, I think that's not, as an, that's not as an important part as who's with you kind of on the inside. Okay. That makes sense. So third business succeeds, gets bought out. Right. Did, Internet, your, so, 1999. And that was your first win. That was really the first business, the, the first and only business win because at that point my wife said, okay, let's come out on top. You're done. 
Yeah. If you want to stay married to me, you got to go do something else. Right. So I started an angel fund. I started investing. I then started writing books and speaking. And that's what I've been doing for 18 years now. Wow. Okay. So you basically took that win and parlayed it into sharing a lot of these lessons. Right. right. Because I think what differentiates me from a lot of the other business experts that are out there, and I even hate using that term, although it's good for Google search. The <laughs> reason I, the reason I'm different is whatever you're going through as a small business owner, I've been through it, right? You're being kicked out of by uh, your partner, right? You're you're, the IRS is coming in. They're going to shut you down because you haven't paid your payroll taxes, right? I've been through all that stuff. You're called in front of um, the, the, the government because people say that you, uh, you um, did prejudice against them. Whatever it is, I've been through all that. You lose your largest customer. You lose your largest supplier. Your best employee leaves when she just told you that she was going to be there for life with that you. That happened to me last Friday or two Fridays so ago. So I've been through everything you've been through. It's not like I was a lawyer yeah. or an accountant and I never did my own yeah. thing. I did my time. Yeah. By the way, no, he didn't tell me I was going to, he, he, but definitely my right hand man unexpectedly left my business and he's, he's a tremendous, tremendous guy. He's actually going to move here to Chicago. He got his dream job. So that's something I've always taken a lot of pride in is people who have worked for my company have learned and done better things, but that doesn't take away this thing of having no, to deal with it. We that. take it personally, right? Yeah. Because they're part of the family. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's, let's talk about this idea of getting unstuck because I think that's really powerful. I think it happens to every business at some point or another. And sometimes when the business, I mean, I've been stuck at points when the company's been around for a long time. You know, like my, I'm nine and a half years in business now and, and I've, like, I've had meaningful sticking points at like year two, year five, and even like this past year. So how, um, tell me more about this concept of, of, of what gets businesses stuck and how do you get businesses unstuck? I think I usually deal with entrepreneurs that have been in their business three to 10 years. I don't usually deal with startups because they don't know what they don't know. Right. Uh, people usually get stuck that their business is not the way they envision it to be. For better or for worse, they've had just enough success to be able to support themselves, but they really haven't had either dream financial success or the lifestyle they want. And usually they get stuck in one of five different areas. One is around sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. um, small business owners are notorious for being horrible at doing marketing and sales, mm -hmm. right? They'd rather deal with uh, customers or create products or whatever it is, but they think somehow marketing and sales is pressure. Like I'm trying to sell you something and that makes me a used car salesperson. So they get stuck. When they do do marketing, they only do it when they don't have any sales. But as soon as they get sales and they start doing the work, they stop doing marketing, the exact thing that got them the sales. So they get stuck in what I call the double helix trap. They also get stuck okay, in- Okay, hold on, but uh, you can't just throw out a, a, your term sure, there. Sure, the double helix What's trap. double helix trap? You know, just, just figure out, just if you could try to visualize, and it's hard to do it really on the, uh, on the radio, is that you have ups, one curve is very, very high and low. <laughs> they're, they're opposites, right? Yep. So when I'm selling, Sorry, when I'm doing the work, I'm not doing any marketing. And when I'm marketing, I don't have any work to do. Right. So you're kind of stuck in something that looks like a, a yep. double helix trap. Yep. So nope. I hear you. Looks like a, a DNA molecule. Yep. Um, so that's one of the biggest parts that people get stuck on because they don't realize that marketing and sales really is just about creating relationships. It's not about selling your stuff. No one wants to buy your stuff anymore. They want to have a relationship with you, your company. They want to have yeah. an experience. Yeah. That's what you got to form. I call every new customer. Which is yeah, amazing. Every single new customer. But I will tell you what, I, I didn't, if I'm going to be completely honest here and unvarnished, I didn't used to. Yeah. And it's made a huge difference when you like literally just call and say, like, regardless of how big or small they are, hey, how's it going? You know, right. I, 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 you know what, what's, your, what are you, what's your challenge? What are you facing? Let me help right. you figure it out. And sometimes, interestingly enough, some of the best calls are the ones where you find out that that's not the person to focus on because it's right. your, your, your product's not a fit for them. Right. And you find that out real quickly, and which allows you to then really double down and invest on the people for whom your product is a fit. And I think that's a very important lesson because a lot of folks are trying to be everything to everybody, and you really have to niche down, right? You really have to say, I'm only going to sell to these people who have this pain, have the money to solve the pain. A lot of start entrepreneurs, they get stuck because they just want to get some revenue. They just want to be busy. Yeah. So they sell to anybody for any price, and that's a race to the bottom. Yeah. Okay, so the number one, uh, really you, said you, have you have five points. Yeah, there's so always five. Yeah, three there or you ten. go. <laughs> the, the second one really is entrepreneurs need to figure out how they can leverage a team. 
a lot of entrepreneurs are really good at doing it all themselves or setting up an organization which is hub and spoke. They're at the center and then everybody works for them, but every major decision has to pass through their center, which is them, mm -hmm. and it makes them feel good because they have a place in this world. Unfortunately, that's not the way companies grow. They grow by setting up more hierarchical organizations where people have true responsibilities. So most small business owners had never had a course or been trained in how to be a manager or a leader. I was fortunate enough that I spent nine years with IBM. I became, once I became a manager, they sent me away for one month to what they called charm school. Yeah. And we had daily trainings on what was it like to be a manager for a whole month. Most people don't have that luxury. So they never knew how to be a manager or leader. And also they don't know how to leverage their team. Even though they have other people in their companies, they're actually doing all the work themselves. They wonder why they're the ones working on Saturdays and the people in the organization are out having fun enjoying themselves. Yeah. Okay. So number two, so number one, sales and marketing. Number two, learn how to delegate and build an organization right. where people have their own set of responsibilities and and you can they can report but not you don't have to touch every decision right it, the test is when you go away on vacation does your company make money yeah that's the test if the company is all about you it doesn't have very much value beyond you the third one really is all about money um, and I learned this lesson the hard way I graduated from college when I was at IBM I got an MBA from Northwestern University IBM paid for it, which was amazing. Yeah. Um, and then when I sold my company, I couldn't read a balance sheet, and I lost a million dollars off the sale price of the business because I didn't understand every single thing that was on the balance sheet. Mm. And what you realize is that most small business owners don't either check their financial statements every month or they don't know how to read them. And it's kind of like a dirty little secret. The accounting person usually likes it that way because that's kind of their way to keep yeah. them. It's like lawyer. It's like lawyers exactly. writing contracts that only exactly. they can read. Yeah. Exactly. So, and they know nothing about cash flow. And every small business goes out of business for the exact same reason, which is they run out of money. So people think that it's about sales and profit, but it's really about cash flow. So that's another place where they get stuck. They don't know how to leverage their current information they have to grow their business. So what's a, what's a good, uh, uh, I guess, model to get unstuck from that? You got to be able to review and understand your profit and loss statement, your balance sheet, and your cash flow statement every single month. And every major accounting system will produce it. If you don't understand it, you can read about it, ask your accountant, whatever yeah. it is. But you got to understand how it compares to now, to where it was last month, yeah. to where it was last year. Yeah. Knowledge is power. And it's actually not about the debits and credits part of it, because that's the mechanics that go into building those things. That's right. the accounting has really two meanings, right? right One right. of them is financial accounting. Well, one is bookkeeping, right? Is what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean financial accounting insights, right. right? Like what was our gross profit this month for yeah. last month, right? Where do we get most of our profit from in our business, yeah. right? What's our overhead? Those kinds of things. Yeah, and what's a depreciation expense, and Whatever how does that affect cash flow, yeah. right? I mean, how does, and it's, it gets very complicated because when your accounts receivable go up, that's actually a use of cash. When your accounts payable go up, that's also, uh, that's a source of cash. And people are like, what'd you just say? Those are the kinds of things you gotta learn. Yeah. What's putting cash into your business and what's drawing it out? You have to realize that the more inventory you buy, that's yeah. a use of cash. Right, right. So, cash, we've had a lot of episodes where we've talked about the concept of cash on the shelf and inventory and what very that means. Important. Yeah. And, and it's a hard concept to understand. It is. When I go out, I would tell you that 50% of the people I meet can, can read a profit and loss statement, 25% of the people can read a balance sheet, and only 5 to 10% can read a cash flow statement. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's problematic and cost me a million dollars, so I know. Yeah. Uh, that's the third one. The fourth one really is, I call it customer experience. Some people call it customer service. Mm -hmm. To me, customer experience is reactive. You've got to be proactive with the customer experience. The only reason someone's going to buy from you versus someone else is because of the experience they have. There's plenty of other people that can provide the exact same service, the exact same product to you. Why buy from you versus somebody else? You've got to be focused proactively on the experience. And the last one really is productivity. People mistake being busy with being productive. Being busy is just doing stuff. Being productive is getting the things done that's gonna move your company forward with all the interruptions, the bells, the buzzes, things like that. Yeah. If we don't get interruptions, we look for interruptions. We thrive on interruptions. Yeah. We think that multitasking- Let me check my Instagram, my right, Facebook. Let, yeah. me, let me, let me, fo let me, um, you know, let me go look to see if I can be interrupted. We are raising a generation of attention deficit disorder individuals and we don't realize that multitasking 
doesn't get things done well. We get a lot of things done really poorly. Yeah. You got to be able to focus. And so my biggest trick in this area is put a yellow sticky note with the word focus on your monitor. And when you have a lot of times focusing, read that three times and that'll bring you back to focus. Yeah. Low tech. No, I like that. One of the things that I've been doing for that is close every tab that's not immediately related to the task you're doing. Because I have this habit where I have seven or eight tabs open for all the tools that mm -hmm. I use for all the things that I do. Because, oh, I'm probably going to need this at some point today, so I'm just going to leave it open in the background. And then it makes it like it, it cuts into your attention, and then you have the notifications from that thing coming up and popping up. And Yeah, I did a thing with Facebook where, and I think this is good just for security, where I actually have to sign in twice. So I have to sign in with my ID, then it sends a message to my phone, and I have yep. to use that. Two so it's much more difficult to yep. do that. Also, what you have to do to be productive is the night before, decide the two things that you want to get done before you do anything else. Before you open up your email, answer any of your phone calls, check your social media feeds. Do those things first for the first hour to 90 minutes of the day. Yeah. And if you get those things done, your day will be productive no matter what. That's really It'll good. It'll be a good feeling. Yeah. And actually, I downloaded a program called Stay Focused. So mm -hmm. I have no association with them. But it allows you to set limits. So I have a 10-minute limit every day on the amount of time that my browsers can be on either Facebook or news sites. Mm -hmm. There's also those it's called combined. Yeah, there's also those uh, tools out there that you can load that actually tracks your time, how much time you spent on each of the applications. Yeah. And I highly recommend people do that for a week. You will be shocked to see where you're spending your time. Yeah, I'll, I'll confess something else. So I'm, uh, I've many times tricked myself into like that thinking you're being productive by doing something else that wasn't necessarily the core activity you need to be doing, right? And like what's helped me get unstuck is just be on the phone all day, talk to customers all day, and do all these activities that I know lead to, to, um, to growth for the company. How do you suggest people stop? Like what's, what's the trick that's worked for you to, for people to stop fooling themselves and thinking? Because like we're really good at fooling ourselves. Right, and people really only change, Pablo, when they're in enough pain. If they're not in enough pain, they don't change. I mean, think about this. People only buy anything because they're in pain, right? Uh, pharmaceuticals, prescription drugs always cost more money than vitamins, right? If people are in pain, they'll buy. So people only change if where they're sitting right today is unpalatable. I just did a little video. I wrote an article on why don't small business owners follow the advice that they pay for? It's because they're not in enough pain to change, and the devil they know is the devil they don't know. So what I suggest is you focus, I call it striving for minimal achievement, right? Focus on one, making one change. Don't try to make a bunch of changes. Yeah. Try to focus on making one small change. Uh, it's called micro-progressing, and see how that works, and then make another small change. Because if yeah. you try to make too many changes at one time or too big a change, um, you're gonna fight to stay where you are. Yeah. Just because you gotta keep your balance. Let's talk a little bit about uh, along those lines about mental health. So you recently did a talk where the title of the talk is something along the lines of you have to be crazy to start a small business. Right, that was tell my first book. Yeah, yeah. you know, obviously, like, it, you, the, you know, you can take crazy as in like, ha, 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 you have to be crazy right. or you have to be like, you know, actually, you know, be struggling with things. So there's, I think they're both true. I think that most people who start businesses have, uh, you, it's not a reasonable, it's not a rational thing to do. It definitely isn't. Right. So with, together with that lack of rationality on that front, like sure, there's some romanticization of that where you're like, hey, it's great, you're, uh, you're crazy enough to go right. start something. Of course, there's a lot of baggage that comes with that. But then there's also the times when, I mean, there's a, tr there's a tremendous, I mean, I've known not firsthand, but secondhand, uh, a handful of people who've committed suicide, who mm -hmm. were in, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, because of all this pressure they put on themselves, the system puts on them, uh, like this, this kind of idol idolization, and the success rate for entrepreneurship is very low. So how, what do you think are some of the things that you've learned about how to manage that aspect of things, such that people who are involved in starting a business can you know, improve their self-care so that they can uh, you know, uh, succeed? Yeah, I think it's, it, it, you know, it's hard. The reason I said that people are crazy to start because it's not a rational thing, as you say. As I said, if you could have a real job, I would. But if you can't imagine yourself doing anything else, that's what you have to go do. But small business owners and entrepreneurs, there's a high, high rate of depression, 
um, and anxiety. And I wrote extensively about this in my first book and recently wrote extensively about it when Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade uh, committed suicide. Yeah. Um, I suffered a lot of depression and anxiety in the mid-90s. And I was very close to being institutionalized. It was really, really hard. But I was lucky enough that I was had the financial wherewithal to be able to pay for therapy, for drugs. I had enough um, support around me by my, my family, my friends, the, the people at work. It's hard because it truly is lonely at the top. And there's a lot of pressure to succeed. I mean, we uh, entrepreneurship, especially now, Pablo, is very romanticized. You know, that you think that you're going to be the next, you know, Bill Gates or... Um, uh, you know, Bill Gates or you know, Elon Musk or, or Mark Zuckerberg, whatever. And I have news for you, and this isn't to be a downer, you're not going to be those people. And that's okay. Yeah. You can run a very successful, high-growth company and not be Bobby Brown. That, that's okay. Yeah. Because there's only five people in the world that are going to be like that. Yeah. And chances are, it's not going to be you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, if you think about it <clears throat> in terms of, you know, like sports leagues, even like thousands and thousands of people play in these sports leagues, there's only one Michael Jordan, you know, and, and that's and that's fine, you know. And the, well, that's what, that's what makes them, but it doesn't mean you can't have a successful, happy life not being those people. You have to understand, most small business owners are really, have a business that's less than $500,000 in sales. And they live a very comfortable life. They have a happy family, and that's it. And that's great. You don't have to be Michael Jordan or Mark Zuckerberg to be yeah. a success. And also, uh, I've been very close. I don't know neither uh, Mark nor Michael, but I've met some people who I will not name, but who are highly, highly successful in people's eyes, in people's public eyes. And uh, it's not all uh, uh, rainbows and butterflies right. either. They have tremendous, tremendous darkness in their lives. Well, you see that with you know Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain, right? Yeah. On the outside, Anthony Bourdain seems to have this great life. He travels around, tastes all this food. You know, he eats dirt for a living. I mean, what could be better, right? Or Kate Spade is a very successful namesake company. Yeah. And there was something about which they couldn't go on. And for myself in the mid '90s. I was very close to that point. The only reason I didn't commit suicide is because I had two young children, and that's really what saved me. But yeah. it gets so dark. You just don't see the dark. You know, I always say the grass is always green on the other side. You don't really know yeah. what goes on behind the scenes. Yeah. Or everybody's naked in front of the mirror. Like You only see, like you, you see other people, and you, you build up their life in a way that is, has nothing to do with reality, but you only see the very bright spots of it, and you don't see all the, all the things that are behind it. Well, especially with, with uh, social media now, it's really just the highlight reel of someone's life. Yeah. But what I'm glad is that when these incidences do come out, yeah. people start sharing their own stories. And I will tell you that most creative people have some kind, they struggle with some kind of darkness in their life. Mm -hmm. That's really part of it. Yeah. Because I believe in order for them to really be creative and not follow the pack, They've got to have some some demons that are driving yeah. them, and the idea is, can you balance that? Yeah. Well, as a blues, we're talking about blues music. Like as a blues musician, a lot of my lyrics, uh, I, I've been described as like, you know, oh man, that's dark. But they're like, oh yeah, it's always like, you know, it, it, and yeah, it's it's a way to, uh, I guess, express and, and find a way for that to come out. In, uh, in as a as a story and not let it affect your your life, you know. Yeah, I think if you can have a channel, that would be that would be great. That's yeah. really what you need. Yeah. That's great. Let's talk a little bit about your books. So you've had a couple of books. You just published Six. one. Six. My wife hasn't read any of them because she says she lives with me. She doesn't have to read them. <laughs> Got it. So she, she, she already knows all of this. Yeah, she's tired of it. Yeah. So, but there's the latest one. The latest one is called Small Business Hacks. And, and what this book is really about, it's a hundred different shortcuts we call to your success. It's all these things that you have to face as a small business owner that you never, ever thought that you would face. Like... What should you do when you go to sign a lease? And, mm -hmm. and you know, you can look this information up on the web, but are you really getting it from the experts that really know? What do you do when someone doesn't return your email or your phone call and you actually know this person? Yeah. Those kinds of things. And so we just gave them, you know, a quick tip to success in, in five or less. I wrote it with Riva Lasansky, who used to be the editor of Entrepreneur Magazine. Mm -hmm. And uh, when did you publish this book? Well, that was published uh, earlier this year. Okay. Okay. Yeah, early this year. Great. And how, how have you seen your writing evolve? So the earlier, the first one was you have to be crazy to start a business, and then there's a bounce one. So what, 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 what's been the progression, and how are your books today similar or different than they were? In the yeah, it's, I think they're very different today. So the first book is really the story of my life. I mean, everyone, I believe, has one book in them, and they have their entire life to write it. 
and then you write that book. And then two years later, someone wants some other book, but you've already written the book about your life, so what are you gonna write about? So the first book was a book about my life. The second book really happened right after the, uh, the crash in 2000. It was about really how to come back from failure, and it was something that you know, I was struggling with. Um, that book, if I read it now, is incredibly esoteric, right? Um, it's very philosophical, things like that. And then I yeah. realized that people wanted insight, but they really wanted uh, authenticity, but really wanted, all right, so what do I do? Yeah. Right, you just can't keep them while this is really hard. Yeah, and I, <laughs> and I share your pain. Yeah, thanks. So I think as I've gone on, the books have a lot been a lot more solution oriented. Yeah. Um, I don't consider myself a great writer. I consider myself a very accessible writer that people yeah. can read. Okay, so they've they become more prescriptive. Yeah, they become because that's really what people want. Yeah. Plus, I write every single day for various news outlets, and most people want something prescriptive and 500, 800 words. So right. you got to be succinct. I do think I do think the philosophy, though. I mean, there are some philosophical points like stoicism, stoicism, oh, stoicism, <laughs> that have helped me out. Like you know, like the idea of like you know the obstacle is the way, or memento mori, remembering that someday you'll be dead, and 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 how that motivates you to you know go and accomplish things. But uh, for me, I'm very <clears throat> action oriented, right? I don't like to sit in one place, and I also believe, as Albert Einstein said, doing the same thing over and over again is just insanity. Yeah. I want to do something different, even. If the thing different doesn't succeed, then I'll learn what I can. I'll try something else that's different. Yep. I'm definitely a person of action. Yeah. So three companies, six books, a radio show. What's two, next? Two kids. Two kids. Um, you know, I've really been focused. I, I do. I do a couple things. One is I do a lot of work for large companies that are trying to get credibility with small business owners. Their customers are small business owners. So they hire me to write for them, to do webinars, to speak, yeah. you know, whatever it is. And then also I've really been emphasizing the radio show because I'm really enjoying that. After 10 years and 500 plus episodes, I've interviewed thousands of people and I've changed the format just so this last couple months where I can go more in depth with people. My interviews used to be five or 10 minutes yep. long, now they're 15 to 20. Yeah. So I talk to less people, but we go more more in depth. Yeah, when I was on your show, that. I think it was a five or 10 right, minutes. Exactly. And I found that I was just too hung in, so I switched radio stations and I went to a different format and I've liked that a lot better to go a lot deeper with people and have a more real conversation rather than just three question interview rock and roll where can people find you so what are your handles your websites sure. and if people are interested in learning more about your books and your advice sure so you just go to my name barrymoltz.com b-a-r-r-y-m-o-l-t-z.com and my handles are all just my name on Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest. Sounds great. Barry, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. For Thanks taking for coming the time, all this way. Yeah, to Small Business War Stories. And, Welcome uh, to Chicago. Yeah, look forward to staying in touch. All right, thanks. Take care. Small Business War Stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes.